send the Marine Corps. We come with our own logistics, our own aviation, our own artillery, our own, our own ground forces and components to do things now. The private that graduated today is not taught to follow. They're taught to lead. Mm -hmm. They get evaluated on leadership. From the very beginning. From the beginning. Mm -hmm. Make a decision. The United States Marine Corps, for 247 years when called upon, has not lost a fight. That's a pretty good brand. But we're looking for something. It's someone who wants to win. Only. Sergeant Major, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for the invitation. 19th Sergeant Major of the United States Marine Corps. Not bad for an organization that's 247 years old. Uh, <laughs> not you, the Marine not, Corps. Not me, yeah, right? <laughs> Although I feel like it sometimes. You know, can, can I just make a comment there really, really quick? Uh, I, serious and jokingly, I get asked, and we may get into it, I don't know. Hey, you know, uh, what's it take to be the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps? First of all, it starts with being able to count by multiple of fours because <laughs> – because it's a four-year job and you, know, you can replace somebody every four years unless you get fired no one has yet knock on wood the other thing is this my wife is a is a retired marine and we're going to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that sort of aspect in a moment um three years and some change into this one we look at each other every day and we're like how'd this happen and two oh my gosh can you believe it that, truly a blessing uh all of us have that have military careers whether they're long or short but we're successful uh, nothing is by accident, but there's a lot of chance involved in it. And it's a blessing every day to sit here and have somebody say, 19th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. It's, it's, it's humbling. There's a lot of hard work in there too, Sergeant Major. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Let's we'll say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it's an honor to be here with you. It's an honor to be here in the museum here at, at the Recruiting Depot in San Diego. And I want to give a special shout out to museum director, uh, Joni Schwartzwetter, for, for setting this whole thing up, bringing us in here and giving us this absolutely tremendously amazing backdrop. You just walked me through it. And the pictures on these walls are meaningful, not only to all of us who've served, but personally to you as you just walked me through some of them. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and we are talking about the Marine Corps and where it's been and where it's going. We can start at the end of the hallway and walk this way. And we can just start continuing to add wings to it. And, that's, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the future of all the services. But the Marine Corps we'll talk about in a moment. But, yeah, it's pretty phenomenal to be here. Well, let's, let's talk about where it started. So April 1988 for you, it started at Paris Island, South Carolina. I heard it's real nice over there. I, I, I spent my time in that part of the woods at Fort Bragg. Yeah. But why join the Marine Corps in the first place? Uh, my story is not surprising, to be, rank, to be frank with you. Um, I grew up, I'm a, I'm a product of 1969, grew up in the 70s. I remember, I remember the Saigon, I remember the fall, I remember that, that, you know, I ran hostage crisis. I remember all that stuff growing up. Not a popular time to be in the military, to be quite frank. Uh, the all-volunteer force was just really a new thing uh, when I was a young kid. In the 80s, the world changed. We had a, an administration, not political statement, we had an administration that really focused our nation on ourselves our independence, our freedom, uh, patriotism, be American, buy American. That created a lot of patriotism in my generation. It really and truly did. Soviet Union was still a thing. Uh, I actually went to college for a year before the Marine Corps to, and majoring in Russian because oh, it was a thing, right? That was my core language in SF was Russian. Yeah, there you go. So, ne never used it because I went to all the Arabic-speaking well, countries. The funny joke is <laughs> I didn't either because by the time I joined you know, the Marine Corps uh, and had been in for a year or two, well, that kind of ended. Mm -hmm. But but the motivation to be in the Marine Corps for me comes actually from high school. I was in Marine ROTC, and I learned. I got a great mentor uh, that really showed me not what it was to be a Marine. That's not what ROTC is about. It's about serving. Now, how important is it to serve your nation? And that's why, that's why I went to boot camp, serve my nation. Well, the Marine Corps is an absolutely unique organization when we talk about the armed services. The, the Marine Corps does, as core competencies, land, sea, and air. 
we have the Air Force, yeah, they focus on the air. Army, Army has some components of that, but not necessarily as core competencies like the, like the Marines do. The mission of the Marine Corps, I'm going to read it here for you. I, I, I know you know it, but the Marine Corps shall be organized, trained, and equipped to provide fleet Marine forces of combined arms together with supporting air components for service with the fleet in the seizure and defense of advanced naval bases and for the conduct of such land operations as may be essential to the prosecution of a naval campaign. What is so important about the range of these core competencies for the Marine Corps that differentiates it from every other service branch? Um, obviously, I'm a Marine, so I have a bit of bias. A <laughs> little, little bias. That's yeah, a okay. little bias. You, you can have that here. But, but operationally, strategically, that bias is, is valid. And here's what I mean by that. Um, the words mean, mean things, right? It is the Marine Corps that is equipped now, today, for deployed uh, with the capabilities it needs to be the first on the scene that enable the joint force. If we were to add words to that definition, it would be in order to enable the joint force to conduct further operations. That's how I would add something to the back of that. But to do that, rather than have to put together the joint staff, the task, the services, to get the COCOMs, to start to allocate forces to take an action, send the Marine Corps. We come with our own logistics, our own aviation, our own artillery, our own our own ground forces and components to do things now, to set conditions, right? Whatever that situation may be, whether it's humanitarian, whether it's actual war fighting, the whole spectrum, the range of military operations, it's one package. And then set conditions for the rest of the, the follow-on forces, if, if need be, um, to take care of the rest of the problem and continue to move and, and accomplish the mission. But the Marine Corps is unique in that. We're manned, trained, and equipment funded to do it. Uh, no other service is to that level. And the differentiation of things that the Marines do is also important here. You hit on humanitarian support that they give all across the world. You're talking about you know, uh, protecting embassies yeah. worldwide. You know, and not, so not only is it a, a combat force first in first into so many places, but there's all of these other missions that they have all over the world that people don't even think about. Right. The, um, in particular, um, you're familiar with the Marine Expeditionary Unit. Yep. That unit afloat, so by, with, and through the Navy, from the, from the sea, on those naval amphibious vessels, the, those L-class ships, which are vital to our national security and to the Marine Corps. But that Marine Expeditionary Unit is literally trained in every single mission that there is across the range of military operations, from aviation deep strike to facilitation of special operation forces to humanitarian assistance, uh, medical uh, uh, capabilities, it's embassy reinforcement, it's full-on amphibious assault, it's, it's, it's the entire board. That's the package that you get with that Marine Expeditionary Unit that is unique to the services within the capacity of, that it has. Again, it's set conditions for follow-on forces, really is what the Marine Corps is designed to do. There's a perspective that a lot of people have about the military that service members and people come in and they serve and they sit back and they wait to be told what to do. Now, granted, we've certainly spent each of our, a lot of time being right. wait to be told what to right, do, right. but that's really not the reality. It's the conversation I had a couple of weeks ago with Colonel Stephen Battle, who's part of U.S. Army Recruiting Command, and we dug into this because the reality is, <clears throat> is that the military, especially today as we look, and we'll talk about the next battlefield and what we're facing, we need thought leaders. And mm -hmm. we don't just need thought leaders at the sergeant major level and the general officer level. We need thought leaders across the entire rank structure to the, to the very bottom people. The military is bringing in, in all branches, they're bringing in scientists, they bring in scholars, they bring in doctors. They bring, oftentimes right off the street, there's direct commission programs and all of them, but they're also develop, a lot of effort is going into the development and the mm -hmm. education of, of soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers as they progress through the ranks. We've all gone to the professional mm -hmm. military mm -hmm. education schools. So many of our senior leaders have advanced degrees that they've earned while in service. You've been a strong advocate for changes to the talent management process. You've called for enhanced development. Also, more transparency, flexibility, control over assignments. There's challenges, I'm sure, in all, in all of those things to, to actually execute that. But the Marine Corps has embarked on what they're calling talent management 2030 and the need to mature the force. Can you talk about talent management 2030, why it's imperative to the, the future of the Marines, and what, do you, what does mature the force mean? A um, lot in there. Let me, just, yeah. let, me, let me build up with a couple of quick sound bites. For anybody that thinks anyone in uniform is just sitting around waiting for something to happen, um, they probably have never worn a uniform. 
Yeah, I agree uh, with that. The amount of training, right? It's like this. If anybody has a football analogy, uh, if I'm a professional uh, football player, I take a few months off. I come in, I start practicing, I build up to the season, I play during the season, and I have a Super Bowl. Everyone in uniform is practicing for the Super Bowl. There's no season, yeah. right? It's, every, it's day. every single day is like uh, full pads, full contact practice, waiting for the Super Bowl. Because every time we employ the military, our force, whether it's in combat, whether it's the range of operations we talked about a moment ago, that's got to be success that moment. It's not like do it three or four times while you're doing it and eventually get into the playoffs. It's every, every, every day. Is, is, there's no off season. It's training. So very, very busy. With that, you have to have a competent force that when it has to be called upon, can win. Period. That's it. Now my bias in the Marine Corps. Pretty good history. Uh, break glass in case of war is generally how the Marine Corps gets employed. Um, you know, right behind us is a saying, if it's on the camera, you know, no better friend, no worse enemy. Mm-hmm. That individual, General Mattis, now retired Secretary of Defense, you know, when uh, 9-11 kicked off, again, another photo down the way here, we put two Marine Expeditionary Units together They were out training, out just doing normal missions, and flew them the longest um, uh, amphibious raid in history, several hundred miles into Kandahar, and took the airport that fast. How do you get leadership that can do that? Training, education, one. Training, mostly education, absolutely. Uh, advances in equipment and capabilities, we'll, oh, we will always see that. But it's the leaders, the leaders that have, to, that have to execute those missions at a moment's notice, that have to be able to lead Marines, lead each other, lead units and organizations, plan and execute those types of missions on a moment's notice. That's what all the services do. For us in the Marine Corps, uh, I would venture to say that most of the things we talk about in talent management aren't new ideas. They're things we've talked about for years, and now we're actually sitting back have a bit of an opportunity in this interwar, loosely, loosely interwar period we have and make the adjustments necessary that we need to that focuses on the population of individuals who are serving and are propensed to serve now. There's always generational change. We've Every service changes generation to generation. We're at that point now to make some of these changes. Why? Um, the commandant talks often about lessons. He gets asked often about lessons learned in Ukraine. In Russia, the one the one we can put a pretty good finger on it is is that the NCOs in the Ukrainian army, the defense forces that have been trained uh, by American forces since the Crimea, are out maneuvering, out thinking, out planning, out fighting uh, their adversary generals. The adversary generals. Let that sink in. Yeah. The power of the U.S. military, and I'll be biased again to the Marine Corps. We say often in the Marine Corps, the NCOs are the backbone of our Corps, but the fact of the matter is there's only so many lieutenants and in any combat operation, especially in the future, and we'll talk about that in a moment, why it's so important. It ultimately is the NCO that ends up taking the hill, uh, outmaneuvering, outthinking, taking the bias for action, and that's how we train our Marines to lead. The private that graduated today is not taught to follow. They're taught to lead. Mm -hmm. They get evaluated on leadership. From the very beginning. From the beginning. Mm -hmm. Make a decision. Go left, go right, open the left side of the door, take the trash out, make a decision, do that. It's the very simple things like that that end up allowing to have leaders that can outthink enemy generals. Well, and if you th- you're saying this, and I've actually, I've never heard it phrased this way, and, and I'm thinking about my days at basic training and where you never sit in a class and they say, today we're going to teach you how to follow. No. Everything you're ever taught is how to become a leader. That's from right. day one. That's right. And, and everything we do reinforces that. I mean, you know your own military experience. Listen, it's as simple as this. In the perfect military scenario, it is life or death situations. And there is ultimately only one or the other. In that situation, your ability to make decisive, well-thought, biased decisions. And I mean bias for the bias is to do something, mm-hmm. Right. To take action. Uh, the most junior leaders in our Marine Corps can do that. At the level with which they'll be responsible for doing so, they can make that decision. And in most cases, they can make those decisions at a level that we don't often think they can. Mm-hmm. That's a maturity issue. And we'll, I can dive into the maturity piece really quick. And it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, there's a difference between what you want 
and what is reality. What we want is to have a more mature force. Well, the reality is we've always wanted to have a more mature force. It's a retention conversation. Do you keep more corporals and captains than you bring in lieutenants and privates? Mm -hmm. Well, anybody would tell you it's better to keep more of the latter than the former or the former than the latter. Now we're in a position where we're actually focusing on kind of changing our, our model of how we recruit and we retain to be able to facilitate that. Meaning um, increasing the number of Marines that we desire to retain, right, is mature. Maturity comes through experience. You don't, experience is a time factor. Better to keep corporals than to bring in a private. That's maturing the force. Now what can you do with advanced education? Now what can you do with repetition? Now what can you do with gained experience? Well, the more you have of that in retraining, gain more experience. It, it, is a, it is a quantity of human capital, of leaders, that when the war breaks out, you are starting at a place of learning or l things that have been learned and experienced that you can't, you don't have time to develop. Mm -hmm. You already have that. That's a mature force. Lastly, and this is the transition I think we'll get into, the complexity of, modern, of, of warfare is always modern tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This museum is full of flintlocks. Haven't used one in several hundred years, I don't think, <laughs> right? The point being, the advance in technology is one thing, but the complexity of warfare does not get less. Land, sea, and air. Well, now it's three or four more domains. Yeah, information. It's all of these things. Um, that complexity requires a more mature individual as well. Those reps and sets, that training, you would understand that, that phraseology as much as anybody else. Reps and sets, education, retraining, training, advanced skills, training, and retention of that experience. That's how you're successful on September 12th. Right, day one, right? Success, Super Bowl tomorrow, mm -hmm. not preseason games. Yeah. You talked about the development of, of non-commissioned officers. We talked about the development of the officer corps, you know, in, in, in how you phrased it there. You know, I think about what I call effective intelligence. And we talk mm -hmm. a lot, on a lot of the podcasts, and one of the major premises of the podcast is these nine characteristics that Special Operations Command uses mm -hmm. to assess and develop talent, mm -hmm. one of them being effective intelligence, which is really that, that you, something comes from being on Earth longer and having more experiences, because then you, those experiences shape you, they shape your thinking, they shape your ability to make decisions in the future based on your past experiences. And that becomes critical, especially when you have mid-level leaders who can develop junior leaders. I wanna talk for a second about the non-commissioned officer structure versus the commissioned officer structure. Uh, because I believe that in building effective organizations, it is a model that the civilian world could, now that I've been in the civilian world for a few years, often beating my head against the wall, could, could really implement. And as I've built my own, my company, mm -hmm. I've actually, my, I've, I have a company that I started a couple of years ago. We're currently f filled with all Green Berets. And I've hired the best non-commissioned officers that I served with mm -hmm. to come work with me because they understand how to get things done. Mm -hmm. This model, I believe, is so important because some of the best mentors that I had as a young officer were actually not the, the commissioned officers that I served with. They were the non-commissioned officers. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who were willing to quickly put me in my place but also coach, teach, and mentor mm -hmm. me. Can you talk for a few minutes about the importance of that structure, how the non-commissioned officer corps complements the officer corps, and why that structure works in effective organizations? Yeah, I, I, um, man, unpack that one. <laughs> that's like a that's like a it's an essay question. It's like right a PhD there. like dissertation, <laughs> right? Um, concisely. Let me, let me talk specifically in terms of the Marine Corps to explain to the Marine audience. When you say NCO, for you and your experience coming from the Army, that means anything up to E9. You mm -hmm. speak in those terms. Ours, we have NCOs, corporals and sergeants, E45s, and then we have staff non-commissioned officers. We're not going to talk about warrant officers because yeah, we don't know what they do uh, in any service. I can't say that to my gunner <laughs> friends. But it didn't, can't yeah, say I can't that. say uh, I can say that. Right. But, but, but so there's levels of responsibility. Right. We're talking about levels of responsibility. And when you talk about the relationship between officers and enlisted, let me let me pause there, because that's that's where I think we, we can see the importance of both. Um, I'm enlisted. You're an officer. 
Some can say, well, here comes another freaking officer again. And you can say, all oh, these freaking enlisted people, right? So, but, but that's, that's, the, that's the very edges, uh, the far and left, right mentalities of, of folks that are in those environments. Here's the fact. Uh, let me talk Marine Corps, but you'll understand it from an Army perspective. I get to talk to the basic school. That's where every lieutenant, before they go into their MOSs and learn what their MOS skill is going to be, they all go to our basic school. And as a sergeant major of the Marine Corps, I didn't know I was going to be able to talk to all the lieutenants. This is a good time for me, right? <laughs> but what I focus on is in the perfect structure in the Marine Corps, a brand new lieutenant reports to their first unit, and they're waiting for them is an 8- to 10-year seasoned E6 staff sergeant non-commissioned officer who is there for one purpose only. It's to say thank you with all the academic uh, experience, and all of the rotten knowledge and the authorities invest in you in Title 10 as an officer. I, as a staff non-commissioned officer, are here to give you experience that you don't have, a perspective in time. And my experience and training and education, having come from the ranks of those you're going to lead to where I sit today, I can offer to you time that you have not spent yet and give you balance to all of your authority. Together, decisions we made that are more right than wrong mm -hmm. it's the 90, it's the 80 yeah. percent take action have bias to your point the reason you hire those guys they don't need a 100 percent answer they have lived in a world of we're going north not northeast by northeast we're going north <laughs> just head north we'll, we'll we'll figure out the last 10 percent bias for action move that's what the staff nco or nco gives to the junior officer that does not change as you progress, mm -hmm. even at the level that I'm at right now, the common knob of the Marine Corps does not need a lot of advice. He needs perspective. Mm -hmm. And that perspective comes from someone who served for 35 years, less than he has, in different environments, coming from a private to today, we can talk a lot about things that he's never experienced, nor his officers or general officers have experienced. Not because they're bad, that's not the point. The point is, it's perspectives, better decision-making cycles. Mm -hmm. that ultimately is what you get with that relationship. And ultimately, when we, do, when we fight, you want better decisions, a balanced approach. Three of the most influential people in my entire career, my platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class David Kozak, my team sergeant uh, as a Green Beret was, uh, was Master Sergeant Rudy Russell and Command Sergeant Major Dave Gibbs at SAC, SOC Africa, Hand, hands down. You know, we have a saying, and I know it's, it holds true for every service. Uh, if you meet a bad captain or, or, or major, Probably their first staff sergeant. Probably their first staff sergeant. Uh, maybe could have been a better quality. We, we know if we find a bad officer, we take it upon our shoulders, we probably mess that up. Very rarely will you find an officer, uh, and especially the, the senior grades, that doesn't click so well with their enlisted. That's usually not their problem. It's usually an experience they had very early on in their career. To your point, your first, your first, your first uh, platoon sergeant had more influence over you than probably anybody. A hundred percent. Yeah. He, when I, I sat down with him when I first got there and he had been in desert storm. This was, th this wow. was, uh, thank this you was very 2005. much. Yeah. So and yeah. to sit there and, and have him say, you know, and then, you know, you're, you're the new Lieutenant. And so you're nervous and you're sitting down and, you know, okay, so tell me about your career. And he's like, I served in, I served in the invasion in Desert Storm. And I immediately was like, just shut your mouth. <laughs> Listen to this guy. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. And, and, and again, we've got more to talk about, not to drag this out. And it comes with a balance, right? Some could take that as go, well, you know, we're in charge of officers. Oh, absolutely not the case. I like to, I like to say this. Uh, hmm. My responsibility isn't to make the decisions for the officer. It's to ensure they, have, they make good decisions. But ultimately, uh, if an officer is going to make a decision, and it, it, it is moral, it is ethical, it is safe, it is just, it is professional, I may not agree with it, but they're in, they're in command. If it is immoral, it's unsafe, it's unjust, it's unprofessional. If it's those things, we should have a further discussion. I'm there to provide that balance because the bias sometimes comes with a uh, mistake that isn't malicious and it's not known. My experience should be balancing that out. Otherwise, I, I, ma'am. I, right. sir. Let's move. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about integration for, for a minute and mm -hmm. talk about integration of females into the Marine Corps, into combat, into combat arms, mm -hmm. really. You mentioned that your wife was a Marine. I had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago down at, at CrossFit uh, 
competition, Wadapalooza in Miami, to sit down with a female named Shailen Laurie. Her episode is going to come out in a couple weeks. Phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. She was an officer in the in the Army Infantry. First female to win the officer honor graduate at the basic infantry officer course. So I mean, truly, and on a single standard between mm-hmm. men and women. Now she's an FBI agent and she won the competition down there. So it was tr- tr- truly amazing. How has the integration of females into combat arms like infantry advanced the Marines and changed the dynamics in the organization? Um, speaking my language, I'm an infantryman by trade. Um, here's what I would offer. First, integration, uh, for those who don't know a time before integration, don't know what we're talking about. True. Like, like here in San Diego is a great, you're in a perfect place to have this conversation. The first female recruits graduated from, from this depot two years ago. In about two or three more years, there were going to be drill instructors, females, who were recruits that don't know what Paris Island even is. Mm-hmm. We, we have traditionally trained females since we've had a recruit train specifically designed for females. So, so, so time has already passed us. The old core is with us, right? In two or three years, they're not going to know what we're talking about as far as females being trained at, at San Diego. That's an integration. We've had a, we've had a male-only recruit training for 100 years just because we didn't, eh, we're good with what we're doing. Not intentional, actually, but, but there's, no, there's no history of that in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Out, in the, out in the operating forces, the formerly closed MOSs, I just spoke to an artillery uh, Marine today uh, that was formerly a closed MOS. She's a sergeant. She's a drill instructor school. She must be doing pretty good. I'm assuming she's a good artilleryman. I'm assuming that. Otherwise, she wouldn't be here. She wouldn't be a sergeant. I think sometimes there's an expectation of mass. There's not an expectation of mass by gender anywhere. Either you can do and perform or you can't. My wife has the best quote, uh, and, and I would use her quote in this case. My wife's point about opportunity is this. Don't ever deny me an opportunity. You don't get to determine whether I can do it or not. Mm-hmm. But once you give me the opportunity, I 100% own whether or not I can or can't. You can't determine that. I think the more people that realize, right, opportunity is the harder part of that decision. It really is. You mentioned this infantry officer a moment ago from the Army. Had she not been given the opportunity, we would not have known she could. Right. She wouldn't have known she could. We were probably trying to think about why she couldn't. Well, let's have the opportunity to let, them, let, let, some, let people figure it out. Mm-hmm. We're past that, mm-hmm. frankly. We're entering a new era for the country, in national defense, for the military. We have spent 20 years mm. we were in declared combat. <clears throat> we can argue all day long if you know, what, what, what we face now on the horizon, but everything changed in that period of time. Equipment changed, people changed, process changed. We learned so much from the different operating environments that we were in. We, ch- it, we changed how we think about war. In many cases, the culture of entire mm-hmm. organizations, as you mentioned, you know, for, that we've been doing things 100 years, had, had, has changed. When you look back on the last 20 plus years where we were in these declared combats, what are the major lessons that you take away for the Marine Corps? That's another dissertation. But. It, it, well, being humorous, there's one thing you can be guaranteed of. There's going to be change. Yeah. Right? Uh, someone that's in my generation, think about when I joined the Marine Corps, there was still a Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Uh, although we can say the Soviet Union may have been failing at the time, there was no idea within three years that I joined the Marine Corps, that the Soviet Union would dissolve. So we had built an entire joint force, Goldwater's, Goldwater Nichols, right, to be able to fight jointly uh, across Europe and to fold the gap and defend. You know, that, that, that was, it was attrition, methodical warfare. I have a bias for the Marine Corps. We invented this thing called maneuver warfare, which was actually invented in World War II. So I don't think so much of the nature of warfare changes. Character does. But we, we're in a pretty unique time right now. Whereas before we weren't talking so much about low intensity conflict and counterinsurgency in Vietnam. We lived through it. Mm-hmm. The doctrine was still focused on 
nation state fighting, right? A, 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 a superpower versus a superpower. We're back there again. Yeah. We can determine whether or not we will ever go man or we mana with the four, four plus ones, right, of the, of the world and the strategy. But the fact of the matter is we have to be able to compete and win if that occurs. We are not fighting the Taliban or Baathist extremists right now uh, because they didn't have 24-hour persistent ISR, satellites, cyber capabilities, submarines, nuclear weapons. That, it's a different dynamic. Balloons. A national government who had elements of national power to employ combat as combat. Getting shot at is getting shot at. But the scope and scale is different. Therefore, the services that we've developed and our capabilities are contributory. Absolutely. Look at the weapon systems we have now. Systems being used right now to fight a counterinsurgency are the number one weapons of choice right now in Russia and Ukraine. Long-range precision fires. Not a product of superpower war. That's a product of counterinsurgency because... ROEs demanded precision and fires. Now we can target things, not areas. That's mm -hmm. a product. That's helpful. We have to appreciate how are the adversaries' capabilities. And, and this is where I think all the services right now are moving to modernization. Marine Corps, love it. We're smaller. We can move faster. We are moving faster. You're a special operations background. You do not mass soft. Yeah. You distribute soft for multiple reasons. You can mass effects. You can distribute the force, you can hide, you can cause a conundrum for the adversary, whether it's small teams that are they're adversarial to you or large organizations trying to find you. Imagine distributing the entire service in a battle space, creating time and distance with better capabilities that can mass effects in a distributed fashion. That's, that's a different way to think even about maneuver warfare. Mm -hmm. Maneuver and, the, and distribute. We'll talk more in the next couple of questions probably about that, but this is the direction that I think all the services must go because our adversary can target us in mass. Well, let's go there. I mean, the Marines are, are really implementing now Force Design 2030, and that is designed for this great power struggle. We've talked for a lot of years when we were in counterinsurgency, we said, well, we have this near peer, you know, eventually we'll fight the near peer. You know, what you're talking about is peer to peer competition. Right. And the realization is that that's where we are. We are in peer to peer competition right, right now. Force Design 2030 has been developed under the ethos that the enemy is more advanced technologically and they're more motivated than ever to combat America. And I think that that's an important aspect because we have fought a lot of wars through time and we fought a lot over the last 20 years of people who were motivated, but they lacked the actual technology to compete mm -hmm. toe to toe. Mm -hmm. Now we have a motivated adversary with like technology. And Another big component of Force Design 2030 is that we can no longer assume that we maintain air, maritime, and information superiority. And I think that that is absolutely critical. And the last point here is that the Marine Corps must be able to survive and thrive inside contested spaces, mm -hmm. to your point at the beginning about mm -hmm. being the leading edge of battle and having to be a distributed service into, mm -hmm. these, organiza into these areas. Under Force Design 2030, what is coming and what, what is being phased out and what is being phased in? Um, that's, a, that's a deep one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> conceptually. <laughs> conceptually. Um, history is a great lesson in military, right? In warfare. Things change, but, but some things don't. Uh, I don't want to use the Pacific because we'll get into a discussion about all there is is the first island chain. No, that's not the case. Let's assume we're in Europe right now. How long did it take the 8th Air Force to gain air dominance over Europe? Time. Time. It wasn't a guarantee on day one. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in Afghanistan. Right. Dominance. Like there's nothing else flying. This, and no offense to, to th that adversary, anybody that's been in contact with those guys, that combat's combat. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of, a lot of big jet fighter aircraft fight, fights uh, over, over Afghanistan that I recall. I don't recall that. No. Whether it's a peer or a near peer, you determine, you determine what the current adversary is. They do. So that automatic assumption, if you're going to operate, you already have certain things that are guaranteed. That is no longer a fact. It's not a fact. Not against an adversary. I would also offer, if we're really thinking about, you know, nation state, us against, like, say, a China, right? Is that, is that the future? Don't know, but there's this thing called proxy, and we've fought that pretty regularly over the course of the last, I don't know, 80 years too. Mm -hmm. 
a nation's capabilities, helping someone else fight us and our capabilities, that's proxy, right? So it's the same kind of thing. I would offer that force design is based on a couple of, of not assumptions, but facts. One, the adversary has light capabilities in all domains, new to our, our last generation of, of warfare. Not historically, but in the last, right. right? Experience is important here. History is important. Two, how do we compete in that environment? Okay. Um, simple things. Deception is new again. Our last 20 years showed us physical presence in most cases was also a deterrent. Mm -hmm. If I'm here and you see me, I won't act. Now we're back to hiding because we can be seen. Being seen is bad. Distribution of the force is interesting. We think in terms historically, and this is where my history, we, we can change a little bit how we operate. Historically, let's use artillery. And this gets into some of your, your real question about things we're doing and not doing. Massing of artillery to mass effects is a thing of the past mm -hmm. because your artillery can now be targeted with small amounts of lethal precision weapon systems and destroy all of your capability. What if you can distribute the capability and still mass the fires? Sounds simple, but quite frankly, it's new. It's new. So in order to distribute that force, now you put the enemy in a conundrum where they have to target not all, they have to target one. They don't know which one. Is it a decoy, right? In what environment are you providing that decoy in cyber, emissions, EW? Not a factor the last 20 years or so. And now how do you mask those effects? And those effects may not be kinetic. They may not kinetic. They may be in cyber. They may be some action in space. They may be maneuvering a force under the water. It may be a resupply or movement of a subsurface unmanned craft that's bringing resupply to a place you're not yet at. But when you're distributed, you maneuver there to provide deception to the adversary. All, that's a new complexity to warfare that we're doing now that is actually distracting and confusing to our peer adversary. That's new. At national level capabilities, right? Conventional warfare at the high end. That takes a lot of work to kind of put that in place. That's Force Design 2030. Mm -hmm. I got to ask this question for all my friends and MARSOC buddies. Where, where does MARSOC fall into Force Design 2030? Service bias. Is that fair? Can I do that? Yeah, please. There are only three organizations <laughs> in, the, in any weapons engagement zone in the littorals. Only three. It's Marines, it's submarines, and it's soft. Everyone else is trying to get there. I think even outside of the first island, this, the first island chain, oh, there's a WES in every littoral on the planet. Okay, there's only three people operating in there, three, three organizations. It's Marines, it's SOF, and there's a submarine within, within striking range of a littoral, a maritime environment. That's not the, uh, a matter of planning. That's a matter of persistence. That's, that's now. That occurs today. By, with, and through, it's a joint force operation. If you think of it in that terms, it's different capabilities. How do you use them, connect them? This is part of the, the future work we're doing. But soft is not absent from the equation. I'd, set, I'd say soft still sets conditions for the conventional force in almost, every, in almost every environment. I agree with you. There's a lot of focus and a lot of pressure, I would add, that has been put on the need to address mental health of our veterans and our, our Marines and all of our service members. But not only our veterans, I want to expand that need to those who still serve, mm -hmm. which is also, which is a much harder conversation to have mm -hmm. because we're at what we're at in effect asking is that, is that we have people who are trying to progress through the ranks to come forward and say, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. It's different when you're a veteran and, and that pat, that part of your life is over even though veterans struggle at a very high level to reconcile and come to grips mm -hmm. with challenges that they face. One of the important factors of some of the initiatives that you've talked about is your holistic view of health and readiness, where there needs to be an incorporation of fitness relationships, even things like finance and mental health. I had a chance to sit down with the New York City Commissioner of of the Department of Veteran Services in New York City. He's a National Guard Army Lieutenant Colonel. And he talked to me about how when you begin to speak with veterans and you start to unpack their challenges, it's never one thing. Hmm. 
it's always a multiple things mm-hmm. and it becomes an onion. Mm-hmm. And when you start to peel those layers back, mm-hmm. you realize exactly what you're talking about mm-hmm. that it's not just mental health. There are, it's, it's fitness. It's the relationships with their family and their friends. How are you focusing on this holistic approach to caring for Marines who currently serve as well as veteran population? Frank, I think I'm failing. Um, because it's not going as fast as I want it to go. And, and I, I, and, Rarely do I use the word I. In this case, I'm going to use the word I. I mentioned to you earlier, I, I attended the uh, Joint Special Operations Senior Enlisted Academy back in 2000, and I think it was 11 or 12. Class five, get some class five if you're out there. Um, and I learned about the preservation of the force and family that, that SOCOM has. It just happens to be that the then current commander kind of invented that. Like, we're going to do this thing. We're going to put it all together. We have too much going on in our soft forces that we've got suicide, mental health. We've got all the things that we see happen in the entire world, and we can't figure out in this highly screened, yeah. highly trained, vetted community, right, of individuals, there isn't a better outcome to that. So we have the POTIF, preservation of the force and family. Learning that and then looking at some of the struggles that I, I see uh, in my family uh, that I see in Marines that, that we experience across the force that all the services uh, experience. We did a working group uh, the first year that I was a sergeant major in the Marine Corps and we went to our MARSOC and let them host it and they talked about the POTIF and we brought in all the people that deal with all of our human performance uh, fact, factors. Well, let me define human performance as, as I have been told to define it based upon the outcome of that, that working group. We think of fitness as the physical, right? We got a lot of strong folks in the world that are alcoholics. We got a lot of people that can lift a thousand pounds, but literally scream at themselves on the way home. We got a lot of people that are so sucked into their phone all day long, they have no connectivity, but but they come in the office and act like they're very extroverted and they're a good communicator and they're a good leader. Uh, Mental fitness, social fitness, behavioral fitness, spiritual fitness. You can't have those four things and have a successful physical fitness. They, you can't have one without the other. We focus on one, we're learning to focus on two, mental, and we're still absent the other three, right? Connectivity. Why is it so, why is it so difficult for us to understand when a unit's deployed together, they're together, they're cohesive. They think, I know when your socks are off because I know the smell of your feet. Yeah. That's how tight we are, right? We communicate. We're together. We're all together. We come back from a deployment and we disperse. We wonder why, hey, Johnson killed himself. And immediately you disperse. You yeah. Come home, you get off the plane, home. And we can't figure out why. Yeah. Johnson doesn't have Smith, Jones, Baxter, and James there with him every day. He's lost that connectivity or she's lost that connectivity. They also may learn, lose a sense of purpose. That, that thing you did on that deployment was important. And if you remove that sense of purpose, right, you get into a little bit of spirituality here. If you don't have a reason to be here tomorrow, there's no higher calling for your existence. Define spirituality however you, de- however you define it. Religion could be that wall right there. I don't care. But if you, f- if you fail to recognize that there's a purpose for you, you're spiritually de- you're deficient. That could be the reason Johnson took his own life. Let alone his family his loss of his friends. And, and for anybody listening, society is hard. Life is hard. But you add to then complexities. Remember, we're, we are practicing for the Super Bowl every single day. There is stress in the military that's only, only probably the same in the civilian sector as police, yeah. firemen, first responders. Because every day, every day they got to save a life. Every day, every day. It's the same for them. I think unless we begin to think about people like things, Right, buy a weapon, you have a required maintenance program. It's not optional. We buy a human. That, that, that holistic fitness must be a requirement, not optional. I, want, I would like to go see a doctor. No, you're going to go see a doctor. And you got to create a culture where that's okay. Right. How many, I, I actually, and not to drag this out, I, made a, I accidentally said this last year. I was asked about mental health on, on, on last year. Do a video. I thought, well, what would I say? Get help. I did. That's video. There's no stigma either. Uh, 
We could talk for hours. I'll close it there. Well, that, but that's the hardest part. I mean, yeah. what you're talking about is that stigma and that stigma that people feel, you know, feel exists that they're going to, they're not going to get promoted. Their peers are going to look at them, their commanders and their senior, you know, the, this, those above them are going to look down and say, oh, they're not fit. They can't do the job. But, but that's what has to be removed. Uh, let me, re- let me be the counter to that for a moment. Please. The stigmas exist. Let's, let's, okay. They exist. Um, it, who has the stigma others or you in other words mm-hmm. i don't want to be seen as weak i'm not even giving someone to understand that i may have a weakness my own self-image prevents me from allowing someone to think that i have a weakness therefore if i go on to see a mental health provider or i run my car into a wall or if i if i self-medicate with alcohol someone's going to say i didn't ask for help because they have a stigma yeah, I have stigmatized my own personality to myself. I don't allow anybody in, right? That's that social piece, right? Mm-hmm. The greatest thing I've seen is, is getting in contact with Vietnam veterans. No one joins the VFW anymore. Why, do they, why are they in it? Because they remain connected. Mm-hmm. We don't want anybody to know our problem now. They solved the problem that previous veterans got, had a hard time with, right? They got after it. They stay connected. You don't, get, you don't get a reunion very often anymore in our last 20 years of wars. No. You just don't get together because you don't want anybody to. Plus, we also in society, I'll be, I mean, maybe counter society for a moment. Thank you for your service. What the f- Almost said a bad word. <laughs> what does that mean? It's a social courtesy like saying good morning when you're having a bad day, mm-hmm. right? You know, you're saying it because you're saying it. In some cases, some mean it. But when a veteran hears that, they're like, what are you thanking me for? My service for what? Do you know what I did? Do you understand? And then I'm absent all my other connectivity. I, or I live, I live in a TikTok world where I see perfection. I see the 800 pound muscle building, you know, special operator, and I want to be them. And I'm like a little skinny guy, but I can shoot really good. I, even my, 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 my thought of myself is, is off. And that's a fake, by the way, that guy's fake. Yeah. That guy on TikTok's fake. He's a poser. I think all that's got a challenge to us. I think for veterans and even those that still serve, it's okay to say, you know what? I'm taking a knee for a second. If I don't take a knee for a second, I'm not going to be very good tomorrow. As leaders, I think we have enough experience right now in this environment. I I won't say his name. In, in, In a fight, in a fight in Afghanistan, one of the best gunnery, company gunnery sergeants that I know, and if he ever hears this, he'll know who I'm talking to. We went out to a position right after a pretty serious uh, firefight in in, in one of our companies, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, Um, and the gunner was shot. He wasn't shot like shot. He was, he was done. He, he had a day, right? He had a day. He didn't like it, but we put him in the vehicle. We took him back to the battalion command post. We gave him about 24 hours. He lost no respect from his company when he went back. His self-esteem was hurt a little bit at the time. But you know what he did for the rest of that five months of deployment? That was the best company gunnery sergeant we had in the battalion. I think we would have lost him within a day or two. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking credit for it. I give him the credit because he went back. And I give credit on the stigma conversation because no one said, oh, Gunny tapped out yesterday. No, they understood. They understood. And, and, and I dare anybody to say, no, Gunny. He would snatch him up like a, you know, by the, by the stack and swivel. Sometimes it takes that. We should do that more. Sorry to drag that out, but no, I think that's a critical. It's it, it's a really, really important conversation, and the points that you highlighted, I think, you know, are so applicable. Again, not only to our veterans, but those who serve, because we. What is the goal of the military? One of the goals of the military that so many people forget, and I can say this because I'm on the outside, and but I'm looking to hire veterans every day in my businesses and the initiatives that we're doing. Is that at some point we want people to come out of the military and go into the civilian populace and be functioning at a high level and contribute to the next phase of their life. And there's a lot of people out there and I have particular problems with them who you know, I call them professional veterans. And the only thing they've ever done is, you know, I was in the military for four years and you know, I'm a, I, and I advocate on veteran affairs. That's the only thing I do in my career, in my life, you know, and it's like, Hey, you got a long life, man. Like figure out something else to go do. You know, what do you want to be? You, that part, you know, that part was your life at one point and yeah. you learned a lot and you want to take that and you want to carry that forward because it shaped you. We talked about effective intelligence, but there are other things in life when you are done to go out there and do that. And what you're talking about is helping people through difficult times while they serve 
to, so that when they get out, it doesn't crescendo on them as a veteran and all of a sudden they're what we read about in the papers and the 22 a day who take their life yeah. because all of a sudden, very much like I felt when I turned my DOD ID card in at Fort Carson and I left and I looked at Fort Carson in the rear view mirror and cried because that was everything I knew and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life and all my friends were gone. My life was gone. That's not what we want. We want people to get out and say, hey, I'm good with what I did in the military. They've took care of me mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and now I can contribute to society in a meaningful, different way. That's a great point. Um, you know, it's amazing. I'll just show my bias again. Former commandant, uh, mid-1990s, General Krulak, he said, the Marine Corps does three things. We make Marines, win our nation's battles, and return people back to society, good citizens back to society. That's it. Um, you know, 20 years. I mean, I think we have to appreciate the amount of, well, we have fewer veterans than post-World War II, right, out there right now because of just a mass of people, but more people had served, therefore there was a community outside of the wartime to, to, to be with, right? Now we've got 20 years. There are people who retired retired that are retiring today after 9-11 20 years yeah, and they buddies. spent yeah <laughs> guys that came in with right i mean and they spent the majority of that 20 years and we're the operational tempo right now we're now we're in a, now we're in a pure competition we're campaigning with the services right to to get after deterrence global forward presence that's a thing right so the op tempo hasn't slowed down the shooting is not going on as much right but the tempo hasn't slowed down. We're just 20, 20 plus years now because there's no slowdown. The massive amount of people that have served during that time, well, the amount of time is massive, but the amount of people is not. So even that connectivity in society isn't there because there aren't other veterans that are everywhere to connect with. That connectivity piece is so important. So now when you go back and return to society, you, you try, <laughs> when you're on the team, if you, if you played football in high school, I did. you're throwing football to somebody today. Because it's your thing. It's a, you can associate with people. I don't talk basketball. I'm from Kentucky. I played football <laughs> in Kentucky, right? I talk about football. I don't talk about basketball. If I don't have that same group of people to talk to, in other words, other veterans, it's a challenge for us. And then the professional veteran, I'll, I'll be careful there because some people are doing good things. But there is a professional veteran who like to get a free chicken dinner sometimes yeah, too. Yeah, no, I agree. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, there, and, I, there are some who are doing amazing yeah, things. Yeah, amazing things. I want to give them all the credit in the world. Uh, I just think it's very, very complicated when you leave service and don't know where to go. And there's a massive amount of effort to make sure people are prepared to, to get out. But, you know, I'll, let, me, let me close up on this one. My wife is retired. <laughs> Laws have changed to do transition. Uh, be part of groups, DD214, training, job assistance. She felt a vacuum after 21 years of serving as a Marine. Luckily, I'm still in and she could remain connected. Mm -hmm. Had she not, I don't know what kind of challenges she would have had. And she's a combat veteran. That has its own challenges too, right? Yeah. Let's talk about the next generation. This is a good topic. I like this one. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you would. Yeah. So, and you're, you're, you're fresh off speaking to a, to a graduating class here, so this is important. But... There are, we would be lying if we did not say that there are cultural differences between generations that exist in mm -hmm. the country throughout mm -hmm. time. We had the greatest generation. It was their duty to serve. You talked about them a second ago. We had the baby boomers. Many of the baby boomers felt forced to serve. Generation X, a little bit hit or miss. Some identified with the greatest generation, some identified with the baby boomers, and then Generation Y came along. Many of them post 9-11 era, but less of them who made service an entire career. Now we have Generation Z. This is the young officers, the NCO of today, the many who were born post 9-11, mm, which yeah. to me, you know, I meet people and it's scary when they say, you know, I was born in like, you know, after 9-11 and you're like, wow, all right, I feel, I feel old now. What do you see in the next generation of Marines and how would you assess their desire to serve? There's a lot of ways to answer the question, but, but 
I put a, I put a, a thing called the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps memo out, I don't know, a year or so ago on this very topic because I kept getting told, oh, this generation, this generation, this generation. So I, I put something out called Old Corps, New Corps. It's worth reading. I won't go into it right now, but it'll get to your point, right? Uh, my instructors at infantry school when I was a young Marine going through school learning how to be an infantryman were mostly all Vietnam veterans convinced that when it hits the fan, there's no way some Pepsi generation popped to Izod shirt collar wearing high and tight, you know, Brian Bosworth fan was ever going to be able to make it through the shit, right? We're gonna, you're you're, you're going to fail miserably. Well, come to find out, right? Uh, that, that wasn't the case. Not me, but generations. However, every generation does have, does have a uniqueness to it. I would say mine uh, is the why generation. Why are we doing this? Mm. Right? So Gunny couldn't just say, do it because I said so, I'll kick your ass. It was, okay, Gunny, but, but why are we doing this? Because I was taught to ask this new idea about tell somebody how to think, not what to think, I don't think it's new. I was taught in school to, to ask why. Why? Why is two plus two four? Because it's freaking four. Yeah, but why? Simple and simple. That was a challenge to leadership then, right? These are guys who were drafted into Vietnam, mm -hmm. right, and were told to do, whether they wanted to or not, and they stayed around. So their experience was do as I say. Authoritative leadership. Not how we were up in the 80s, right? Uh, except for Rambo, who <laughs> always won, by the way. Yeah, who <laughs> always won. He never ran out of ammo. Never either. ran out never of ammo. Never reloaded. There's, by the way, there's a message in there we can talk about propensity to serve here in a minute, right? Um, what's, what's today's generation right like? Well, even Gunny could lie to me then. I could ask the question, why? Gunny may not know, and she might tell me something. I'm like, okay. Now you got somebody in the back of the room going, hey, Google. <laughs> Gunny said this, right? And Google's going to go, Gunny's a dumbass, right? Say that again. Turn the vo volume up to Google. Gunny's a dumbass. Okay, now we have a different, pe different people to communicate with. If I, could, if, I could, if I could put in a 35 plus year career of seeing a couple of different generations, I have children in two of them, right? It's how we communicate that probably changes or doesn't change to fit the generation that's going to serve, right? There's pretty good books about how America was going to fail in World War II because that generation wasn't tough enough. The greatest generation. Or that draftees, or that the all-volunteer force, or that Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, I don't know what that means anymore. We're going to run out of letters pretty soon. <laughs> Right. I don't know. It's, I was trying to look what's next. Right? I actually couldn't find it. Are, are, are never going to have enough grit. There's one change that we've never experienced. The effects of COVID, not the pandemic itself, but how we, uh, where we see the find success in isolation is contrary to team. And if I think, I, if I think there's a challenge that's new right now, it is, we have to focus more on how to tell people how to be in a team right now because the next three years, people have not, they don't know that, yeah. right? Other than virtually, virtually, but getting on, on the ground and sweating together and talking together, not a thing. That's going to be a challenge that's unique, quite frankly. And I'm not sure how we get after that other than to have to teach people to get outside, get dirty, roll around in the dirt a little bit because that's what the military does. It'll be interesting to see, but I think generationally sometimes we overplay it if we ignore the generational differences. If we know what they are and admit them, communicate with that generation, not force them to communicate like we do, probably a better place to start. What you just said about the implication of COVID on what I call really the next, the up and coming, if you really look at the civilian or the corporate world, the next yeah. corporate leaders, I talk about this all the time, is very scary. Because if you go back to, let's take, for example, the graduating class of 2019, 
from, from college or high school, mm -hmm. okay, who has now been in the workforce for four years, going on four years, they only have a couple of months where they were going into the office and interacting with people. Four years now into their life, mm -hmm. they are going to be managers or they mm -hmm. are managers, which means that they're going to lead others That's and have right. direct reports. Yep. And the only interaction that they understand is a Zoom call, which is transactional in nature. Yeah. And then, like you said, they're back on their phones, they're doing other things. And how much gets done when those meetings end in the hallway, the five minutes after the meeting, when you're sitting and talking to someone? when you sit and go to lunch with somebody that they don't understand mm -hmm. and they don't have. But now companies mm -hmm. and organizations are looking at them and us who have had those experiences mm -hmm. as more senior leaders default to, well, yeah, I'm just going to put them in charge and they're going to be able to lead their team when we come back to the office. No, they're not. No, they're not. Their interpersonal skills are, are not there. And a generation already challenged. So here's the, here's the one generational thing, again, I think that is unique. The connectivity of a generation that, that is connected to the entire planet and never has to actually engage with anything or any place else on the planet, unique to history. The television didn't do it. You could see a picture, but you couldn't, like, you couldn't interact with it, right? right? I can have a conversation and have a friend who, who's imaginary, like totally imaginary. Not a human, it's a computer talking to me. I think it's a human. Yeah. That's a whole different dynamic. But the interpersonal relationship stuff, especially where you're talking about with military, that's the thing we were most we were most cherished for is being able to engage and lead and take a group of people and move them and get them to do things. Whew. I mean, that's a little bit of re-engineering. I think we'll be fine doing it. We'll, we'll be forced to do it because conflict is coming. And you can learn a lesson one way or the other. That will bleed itself, bleed itself out and I mean bleed literally it'll bleed itself out before we start to click again and it's like it's, it's, it's the uh, pig through the snake right now too that'll come and go however having said that I have some I have some 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 good thought those companies are quickly figuring out the ones that brought her back to work for first their privates are back up the ones that are still thinking zoom's the way to go they're trying to figure out how to work in this new space and environment known as people right like yep. coming, like come to work and go to lunch. They're having a hard time in that environment. Yeah. 35 years in the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major. What do you tell the 18 year old kid who's standing outside the Marine Corps recruiting station, <laughs> wondering and trying to decide if this is their future? And before you answer that question, I'm, I'm going to give you my bias to the Marine Corps. Hands down the absolute best advertising. And I don't care who you are or where you served. You watch a commercial for the Marines, you're ready to go serve immediately. I know I am. What do you tell that person? Every service uh, recruits what it thinks is going to be successful in its service. And I commend every service. Uh, and I say that, and I'll, I'll throw my, I will throw my bias in here in a second. Every service recruits exactly what it needs. I do not know what their Air Force is looking for. I'm not in the Air Force. I don't know what the Navy is looking for. I'm not a sailor, nor am I a soldier. I'm a Marine. And the one thing, the only thing that consistently draws someone into the Marine Corps is not education, bonuses, uh, anything. Marine recruiters, I just talked to recruiting school today, and I, re I get reinforced every time I'm here to make sure we're not changing the model. We sell the brand. The United States Marine Corps, for 247 years when called upon, has not lost a fight. That's a pretty good brand. You could probably find some disparate historical example that might tell you, well, there's that one day. That's a pretty good brand, and it's true. And all the services are fishing, fishing in the same pond. And anybody hearing us from another service, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm, I'm con, con, condescending to you, but we're looking for something. It's someone who wants to win only. Not try to figure it out and hope tomorrow that it's going to be a better day. It's to win, period. And that's what every commercial shows. You don't see a commercial, come on, guys. You see a commercial that says, follow me. 
You don't see a commercial that has people doing jumping jacks. I'm not saying anybody's doing that, playing, throwing, throwing balls at each other and doing paint gun fights. We shoot guns. We drop bombs. We come from the sea. We swim. We fight. Make map training. We put on like the, the recruiting video. That's dangerous. That's violence. Absolutely. Because war fighting, even in the service, war fighting is the only thing we focus on. Back to your original paragraph. Other server, every other service has other missions outside of a simple war fighting function. Ultimately, it's war fighting. It's the Department of Defense. But they've got other functions. We're very fortunate. We don't have to worry about the challenge of some of those other things, which would change the brand, I think. We would have to do something different. We only do one thing. One thing only. Locate, close with, destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. And every recruit, male or female, on both depots, everyone, same training schedule, same recruit training, same knowledge, same history, same everything, male or female, basically trained riflemen, all of them. That's a brand. That's what draws them in. That's why I'm here. It's the only reason to join. It's the only reason to stay. That's it. You ready for the test question? I'm ready for the test question. As Aunt, a- wrong. <laughs> no, I answer the, I ask the question. You answer it. <laughs> Sergeant Major, as we close out, the Jedbergs in World War II had to do three things to be successful. Core foundational tasks. You could call them habits if you wanted. They had to be able to shoot. They had to be able to move. They had to be able to communicate. You may have heard of that before. If they did these three things with the utmost precision, then they could focus their attention on more complex, more challenging tasks that came their way, like arming and equipping the French resistance, training them, and fighting the German army. What are the three things that you do every day in your world to be successful? Personally? Personally. Wow. Drink coffee? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, uh, there's many books on seven habits and all these different books, right? I, what I find is... Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a very, I'm extroverted. Uh, I'm like that squirrel guy, right? But routine and habit is something that six, everybody that is six, there are very few people, even the ones that lie to us, tell us they're like, they don't have any habits. They are very exact in their routine. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me personally, in my, I would say my staff, anybody I've ever worked with knows this. If I don't eat, if I don't, PT, and if I don't have time to read, I'm probably, it's not going to be really a good day. Now, why would you do those three things? Um, You've got to take care of your body. Well, that's the nutrition piece or not. Food is good. That's the only reason to to do it, right? Food is good. You've got to take care of your body. I think the older we get, the more experienced we get, the more time we have that strains us, the more discipline we have to exhibit by ensuring we keep our bodies fit. It's also a time to think when you're doing PT. You time to reflect, right? When you're in your own world and you've got your headphones on, I get more done in an hour or so that I get to squeeze out of a day, whether it's at 4.30 in the morning or at noon or whenever, I, I get a lot done there in my mind. Reading on the mind piece. Um, I'm, I'm a creature of the Marine Corps. We, we require Marines to read books at every, every rank in order to be eligible for promotion as part of their development. I'm sure every service does this. I had fortunate leaders that taught me early on that you better read something, but don't read that. You know what I mean? Read something that, that, that gives you a perspective. Read things that you don't normally have interest in until you find out there's a reason to have interest in something. I'll read a lot of history. Um, I've learned to not read about firefights anymore. I read about campaigns and wars. The reason I do that is because you can learn those lessons. Those who fail to know their history are doomed to repeat it. It's probably said many different ways, but it's, that's, the, that's the phrase. You can learn a lot. You can learn a lot by reading what someone's done and their mistakes to ensure you don't make them again. I think it's also important to read for the same reason about, about PT and it takes discipline. You have, to be, you have to manage your time and it gives you time to think. Or if you're like me, I can't read one thing at a time. That's why I have a Kindle. I got like nine books I read at the same time. Because there's a little squirrel in there, right? There's a little squirrel in there. Um, I, it doesn't matter what my personal habits are. I think, I think anybody to be successful, you, you've got to have those three or four things that if you don't do them, you know your day is not going to be good. 
because you know something's wrong, mm-hmm. right? Irregularity is great. Oh, and shoot more guns. <laughs> eat, eat to take care of your body, PT to think and reflect, and read and learn the lessons of the past so you don't repeat them. Yeah. I think those three, I think those three are great. I had a, I, I um, had a general uh, once who, who worked in my command who he said, leaders need time to think. And I was a young captain, and obviously I was like, that's stupid. What's he talking about? And you realize later in life, you talk about effective intelligence yeah. like we did, that, that that is so important. It's important. So important to disengage and the amount of processing you do when you when you have time to reflect and think, I think, is, is so meaningful. And it doesn't matter at what level. Yeah. The more senior, the more difficult. Yeah. Uh, for all us, for senior enlisted, your bosses are spinning. <laughs> Give them space too, by the way. But even for anybody, the more you... The more you're responsible for, the slower you probably should think. The more deliberate you should think. With responsibility and experience, it doesn't always come speed. It should come with thought, and they're not the same thing. I can't sum experience. it up any. I can't sum it up any better than that. Awesome, Sergeant Major. Thank you. This thank has you. truly been a, an honor. This is a great day for the Jedburgh Podcast. Great day for me. If I'd still been in the army, I probably would have never had a chance to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got yeah, you would. No, <laughs> I've gotten to do cooler a lot a lot of really cool things in the army. I've done even better things since I've been out doing this podcast. But really, really an awesome day. One of the best days of my year is celebrating the Marine Corps birthday. They do a great job on that. Right before Veterans Day, we do it in New York every year, and then we hit the parade. Yeah, but Sergeant Major, hoorah! Hey, can I say thanks to you? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the things you talk about, the questions you ask, the responses that you're trying to get uh, are influencing people. You're still leading. You're still leading, and you're also helping. And if I could say one more thing as I got a chance to think about it, um, uh, I would ask people to think about humility sometimes, right, as a leadership mm-hmm. trait. It's not in there. It's not written in anybody's book, Be in your Humility. Humility is a powerful tool, and humility doesn't mean uh, cowardice. Some of the most aggressive, dangerous humans that I know are, have humility. Um, you've got humility. Thanks for sharing with everybody. It makes, it makes an impact. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank that you. means a lot. We're here at the Marine Corps Recruiting Depot, San Diego. We're in the museum. We just had the amazing opportunity to sit down with the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Troy Black impactful conversation about where the Marines have come, his 35 year career, and where the Marines are going in 2030 and beyond. Absolutely incredible conversation you're not gonna wanna miss. But we're gonna take a tour of the museum with John Vasquez. He's gonna take us through all the different rooms in here, show us where the Marines have come from and how they have changed history through 247 current years. But we're starting right here with the colors. This is actually the battle colors, a rendition of the battle colors of the Marine Corps. It represents all of the campaigns, all of the service ribbons and medals and so forth that the Marine Corps conducted in its entire history. We'll go ahead and start with the Centennial Room. So here you have uh, the colors that moved from Mare Island, uh, uh, the, the American ensign that moved from Mare Island, which used to house recruit training, was eventually moved down here to San Diego. Machine guns that were used at that time period, uh, the Model 1895 machine gun, they called it the potato digger for this particular movement that would actually make while it was firing. So this room right here uh, represents the Vietnam conflict and focuses on the history of the Vietnam War and the Marine Corps. This tunnel actually represents tunnels in which uh, uh, Marines, they nicknamed tunnel rats, would conduct operations going underground because a lot of the Vietnamese kept their defenses underground so they can hide from uh, American units as well as air power. And then you would go through the tunnel and come out to the other side, which would be the command area in which the Vietnamese would be housed and or have, uh, uh, you know, their commanders, decision makers and whatnot. Um, here we have a large terrain model. And we use these terrain models to actually help out, help teach the recruits uh, the distinction of the various terrains and the battle space of the various conflicts to understand how the terrain and weather would affect operations and how difficult it would be to operate in that environment. One of the things that I also like to point out is Vietnam was a small unit war. Squads, platoons, and so forth, and be able, being able to conduct operations and counterinsurgency operations uh, uh, against the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese units. So here this represents reconnaissance Marines that would go out for weeks at a time, if not months, conduct operations far out into the hinterlands. 
uh, um, and try to locate the enemy, which was very elusive at times. Uh, one thing that I also like to point out in this photo, it shows a tiger. Now that tiger uh, uh, pelt right there, or skin, uh, uh, was actually you know taken by this reconnaissance unit after that tiger stumbled upon them. And I've talked to many Marines that said they experienced tiger attacks or seen the yeah. aftermath of tiger attacks out there. Because again, when you're in the field, you're out there with the environment, including all the animals and wildlife. These weapon systems here, going from the grenade launcher uh, to the M16, uh, the M14, and then this 30-odd-6 Winchester Model 70. And that Model 70 is interesting because it's a replica of Carlos, Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hathcox. A sniper rifle that he used in Vietnam, again, uh, nicknamed the White Feather for his exploits during the Vietnam War and so forth. We still use this. Yeah. And this is dedicated to the uh, Marine Corps Women's Reserve of World War II and the important contributions that females had during this time period, which laid a hallmark for you know the current force. Uh, of course, the first females began enlisting in the Marine Corps in World War I, okay, but it was World War II in which they really began to blossom. So this room is actually dedicated uh, to those females who were a major part of the Marine Corps during World War II. And again, here you have some of the uniforms and so forth, uh, colors of the women's reserve and whatnot. And now we're moving into the Korean room, the Korean conflict. So we're looking, you know, 1950 to 53. Uh, um, here you have a map of the Korean conflict. Uh, looking at the initial stages as well as secondary stages of it, that conflict, going from uh, the 38th parallel down to the Pusan perimeter, defending of that Pusan perimeter through the Inchon landings, back up to the Chosun Reservoir, and then the stalemate for the next couple of years. So that's important there. So this room right here we call our uh, medals and decorations room. It's focused on medals and decorations, uh, the battle lineage of the Marine Corps. If you look up top here, and earlier I talked, I mentioned the battle colors of the Marine Corps. This represents all of those streamers that are on that battle colors, every from every conflict stretching back to the revolution up to the present, including not only the campaign ribbons or medals, but also unit citations. So all of these weapons, uh, they're all real. Um, they, some of them were taken off the battlefield, some of them donated throughout time, uh, various units they gave them to us and so forth. Well, thanks. This, no worries. this was great. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Glad. American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow. <laughs>